This is the Systemic Disorders with Ophthalmic Manifestations, Part 1, presentation by Jacob McGinnis, adapted from Essentials of Ophthalmic Nursing by the American Society of Ophthalmic Registered Nurses. The educational objectives for Part 1 and Part 2 of this presentation are to discuss the signs and symptoms of ocular manifestations of acquired immune deficiency syndrome, identify at least two congenital disorders with ocular manifestations, list at least four ocular manifestations associated with diabetes mellitus, differentiate between the ocular manifestations of the herpes simplex virus and the herpes zoster virus, describe the ocular manifestations of two systemic autoimmune inflammatory conditions, discuss the ocular pathologies related to two hematological disorders, and identify the signs and symptoms of ocular manifestations of toxoplasmosis. A large misconception about ophthalmology is that we're just here giving people glasses. But really, we treat a lot of patients that have many systemic disorders that are either inherent or acquired, and these all have effects on the ocular system. Ophthalmic manifestations that derive from diseases or disorders like diabetes, lupus, or rheumatoid arthritis have been known to have debilitating visual consequences if left unrecognized. This presentation aims to illustrate ocular abnormalities associated with common systemic diseases. A brief review of these multi-system processes will help a registered nurse recognize ocular signs and symptoms that develop as a result of these disorders. Uh, consideration of preventative and treatment options of the ocular manifestations are also addressed to assist a registered nurse in developing and implementing an appropriate plan of care for the patient. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS, is a constellation of immunologic diseases caused by two human immune deficiency viruses, HIV-1 and HIV-2. Its pathophysiology and etiology are the virus destroys T lymphocytes and impairs other immune cells, causing progressive and severe immunologic compromise. The person becomes susceptible to multiple viral, fungal, and parasitic opportunistic infections that are otherwise easy to treat in people with a healthy immune system. The pathogens infect the eye in the later stages of the illness. Ophthalmic disorders may be early signs of disseminated or multifocal disease processes. HIV may be transmitted through sexual contact, through direct contact with contaminated blood or blood products, and via the placenta from the mother to an unborn child. Ocular Manifestations of Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome Ophthalmic manifestations are common in AIDS patients. Cotton wool spots on the retina are the most common manifestation. In addition, intraretinal hemorrhage may be the first indication that a patient has AIDS. In this image, we see cotton wool spots in the retina, which look like wool, and then we also see intraretinal hemorrhages here. An important thing to remember with patients that have acquired immune deficiency syndrome is that opportunistic infections, in particular organisms leading to choroiditis and chorioretinitis, are one of the most serious ocular manifestations seen in patients. Common ocular diseases include cytomegalovirus, pneumocystis carinae, syphilitic infections, toxoplasmosis, herpes virus infections leading to progressive outer retinal necrosis, retinal and conjunctival microvasculopathy, punctate or geographic ulcerative keratitis, Kaposi sarcoma of the conjunctiva lids or orbit, squamous cell carcinoma of the conjunctiva, molluscum contagiosum, herpes zoster, and non-granulatosis iritis. Evaluation and management. Tests that are performed for a definitive diagnosis of ocular manifestations of HIV or AIDS are intravenous fluorescein angiography, direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy, slit lamp microscopy, and external ocular examinations. 
Management varies according to the specific ocular manifestation, but antiviral therapy is the primary treatment for viral opportunistic infections. For our nursing considerations, prevention is essential to reduce the risk of transmitting HIV. Several approaches have been implemented to decrease the spread, such as education for at-risk groups, like sexually active people, intravenous drug users, people with hemophilia, and other recipients of whole blood transfusions, heterosexual partners of these persons, and children or mothers with HIV infections. Healthcare providers are encouraged to use universal precautions in their clinical setting. There has been a concern that viral transmission could occur by contact with tears or a corneal transplant. However, there is no evidence infection is spread through direct contact with ocular tissues. Nurses can also provide psychological support and referral to community resources, family, partner support, and counseling. Patient teaching regarding common side effects of antiviral drugs, which includes headache, nausea, and dizziness, is also an important intervention. Albinism is an inherited deficiency or absence of skin, hair, or eye pigment. This def deficiency may be limited to just the eyes. The most common types of albinism are congenital leukoderma and leukopathia. The pathophysiology and etiology. The absence of the enzyme tyrosinase blocks the production of melanin causing albinism. Aside from having the characteristics of white hair and pink skin, the melanin is also absent in the iris and the epithelial layer. Albinism may also be an inherited autosomal recessive trait in which tyrosine levels are normal and only the eyes are affected. Ocular Manifestations of Albinism the lack of ocular pigmentation varies in degrees from blue-gray to diaphanous. Severe nystagmus, or the involuntary shifting of the eyes, and astigmatism are common manifestations of albinism. Visual acuity is reduced due to photophobia and hypermetropia and other underdevelopment of the fovea. Another clinical sign is transillumination defects, which result from light reflected through an abnormally pigmented iris from the choroidal layer. Because of the lack of melanin, individuals with albinism are at risk for developing neoplasms of the eyelids. Evaluation and management and nursing considerations of albinism include the ophthalmic evalu evaluation includes visual acuity, an accurate refraction, and direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy. Preventative measures include the use of sunscreens to avoid cutaneous neoplasm and eyewear with ultraviolet light protection. Our nursing considerations are to encourage avoidance of solar exposure, the use of sunscreen, and wearing sunglasses to help reduce effects of photophobia. Psychological support should be provided due to the patient's altered body image and isolation. Genetic counseling can also be offered. Cytomegalovirus CMV retinitis is a widespread virus with manifestations ranging from asymptomatic to severe end organ dysfunction in immunocompromised patients with congenital CMV disease. Human cytomegalovirus is a member of the viral family known as herpes viruses. Human cytomegalovirus infections commonly are associated with the salivary gland. It's pathophysiology and etiology. Once CMV is transmitted and the primary infection clears, the virus remains dormant in myeloid cells. Vital replication and reactivation are contained primarily by cytotoxic T cell immunity. However, when reactivation occurs, virons are released into the bloodstream and other body fluids, leading to the presence of symptoms predominantly in immunocompromised patients, like patients with HIV. Its etiology, CMV is a double-stranded DNA virus and is a member of the herpes viruses. Like other herpes viruses, after recovery of the initial infection, CMV remains dormant within the host. 
viral reactivation occurs during the compromise of the immune system with immunosuppression. To ocular manifestations. The invading cytomegalovirus organisms damage the retina, slowly starting from the outer layers of the retina and descending to the deeper layers. Cotton wool spots appear as more granular. granular. They arise from the retina's major blood vessels. CMV typically has a poor prognosis for the patient and is seen at the end stages of diseases like AIDS. Uh, some ocular manifestations also include blurred or dim vision, central retinitis with hemorrhages, loss of peripheral vision leading to tunnel vision and retinal detachment. And in this image here, we see an inflamed optic nerve and a lot of hemorrhaging coming from blood vessels. Um, this central vision here is partially spared, but it appears that there are some exudates there as well. Evaluation and management and nursing considerations for CMV retinitis include a diagnostic evaluation includes direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy, as well as intravenous fluorescein angiography. Antiviral medications do not eradicate the virus from the eye, but help in managing the disease. Medications such as gancyclovir, foscarnet, cytofovir, and famavirocin are commonly administered for treatment of CMV. Ophthalmic treatments include intravitreal injection or implant, vitrectomy, silicone oil, and retinal detachment repair. Untreated CMV may progress to blindness and bilateral loss in 25% of cases. Our nursing considerations should include a plan of care that involves teaching the patient about side effects of the drugs used, headache, nausea, dizziness, and the use of blood count monitor to check for decline to dangerous levels, prompting a temporary discontinuation of the drugs. In addition, due to the effects of the antivirals on the renal system, the patient should be monitored for kidney damage. Some other considerations include providing low vision aids, referral to community resources, and psychological support. Diabetes mellitus is a metabolic disorder characterized by the abnormal production of insulin, impaired utilization of insulin, or both. Its pathophysiology and etiology a patient with diabetes mellitus has the potential for hyperglycemia. The pathology of diabetes can be unclear since several factors can often contribute to the disease. Hyperglycemia alone can impair pancreatic beta cell function and contributes to the impaired insulin secretion. Insulin resistance is attributable to excess fatty acids and pro-inflammatory cytokines, which leads to impaired glucose transport and increases fat breakdown. The duration of insulin-dependent diabetes and the adequacy of serum glucose control constitute major influences in the development of diabetic retinopathy. In the islets of Langerhangs in the pancreas, there are two main subclasses of endocrine cells, insulin-producing beta cells and glucagon-secreting alpha cells. Beta and alpha cells are continually changing their levels of hormone secretions based on the glucose environment. Without the balance between insulin and glucagon, the glucose levels become inappropriately skewed. In the case of diabetes, insulin is either absent and or has impaired action, like insulin resistance, and thus leads to hyperglycemia. Diabetic ocular manifestations. Clinical signs and symptoms may begin with blurred vision due to changes in refractive error because of the swelling of the crystalline lens that may indicate a fluctuation of blood glucose levels. Typically, the lens of the eye starts to absorb glucose once a patient's blood sugar goes above 300, which leads to a refractive index change. Cataracts occur earlier than in, non, than in the non-diabetic population. Retinopathy, which includes proliferative or non-proliferative, is characterized by arterial and venous changes, macular edema, the presence of microaneurysms, vascular occlusions, vitreous hemorrhages, and retinal detachments, retinal hemorrhages, hard exudates in the retina, and cotton wool spots. In the top image here, 
we see non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which includes our exudates, our cotton wool spots, our microaneurysms. The bottom image shows proliferative diabetic retinopathy and a severe stage of it. Here, the, pri the primary difference between the two is neovascularization, which is creating weak vessels that grow from the retina into the vitreous. And as the vitreous shrinks with age, these blood vessels are pulled on and can tear open, leading to vitreous hemorrhages. And over time, these fibrotic membranes that develop, which create tractional retinal detachments. Uh, this is called wolf jaw retinopathy. Um, other ocular manifestations include glaucoma, rubiosis iridis, ischemic optic neuropathy, and blindness in the end stages of ocular involvement. Diabetes remains the leading cause of blindness in the working age adult. The evaluation and management includes uh, intravenous fluorescein angiography and direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy. Management consists of a referral to an endocrinologist and providing education around tight control of blood glucose levels, which is key to minimizing ocular and systemic complications. Additional procedures to slow the progression of retinopathy are uh, laser photocoagulation, pars plantar vitrectomy, and more commonly now, anti-VEGF injections. Nursing considerations include, again, education around tight control of blood glucose, in addition to ongoing patient education and a thorough assessment of duration and level of control. It has been proven to limit ocular manifestations. Other systemic conditions may affect the development of diabetic retinopathy, including hypertension, elevated lipids and triglycerides, kidney diseases, and cardiovascular disease. Patient teaching can cover self-management to control and maintain an ideal body weight in patient with type 2 diabetes, which may include regular exercise and a good diet. Patients are encouraged to have annual dilated eye exams, regular exams with their primary care provider and endocrinologist, and regular self-monitoring of blood glucose. The Epstein-Barr virus is a herpes virus that causes various disorders. According to the CDC, approximately 95% of adults between the ages of 35 and 40 are infected by Epstein-Barr virus in the United States. Adolescents and young adults who contract Epstein-Barr have a 35 to 50% chance of developing infectious mononucleosis. Epstein-Barr may remain dormant in cells of the immune system. In a few cases, carriers of Epstein-Barr develop nasopharyngeal carcinoma and possibly Burkitt's lymphoma. Its pathophysiology. After exposure in the oral cavity, Epstein-Barr virus infects B lymphocytes. Morphologically abnormal lymphocytes develop mainly from CD8 T cells that respond to the infection. After the primary infection, uh, the virus remains within the host, primarily in those B lymphocytes uh, for life, and undergoes intermittent asymptomatic shedding from the oropharynx. Its etiology, Epstein-Barr, is another herpes virus with double-stranded DNA enclosed by proteins. It targets the B cells and utilizes their molecular machinery to replicate the viral genome. The virus causes B cells to differentiate into memory B cells, which then can move into the circulatory system or become latent until a trigger causes reactivation. The transmission of Epstein-Barr occurs in several ways, such as deep kissing or food sharing. Increased levels of viral DNA are found in saliv salivary secretions after the initial infection. And children can be infected after eating food that has already been chewed by an Epstein-Barr infected individual. Ocular conditions associated with Epstein-Barr are follicular conjunctivitis, here seen in this bottom image, epithelial punctate or microdendritic keratitis, and ring-shaped keratitis. Those are all going to affect the cornea. Epstein-Barr virus also causes a decrease in either unilateral or bilateral visual acuity, and other manifestations include acute or chronic non-granulotomous iritis, optic neuritis, again seen here, 
papilledema also seen here, and convergence insufficiency in extraocular muscle palsy. The evaluation and management of Epstein-Barr virus includes diagnosis that's based on viral serology, management of Epstein-Barr related ocular disorders, um, antiviral therapy, either taken orally or topically, and steroid use uh, for inflammatory changes. Our nursing considerations include assessment of visual acuity, providing emotional support, uh, drug therapy management, and ongoing patient education. Giant cell arteritis, which is sometimes called temporal arteritis, is an inflammatory disorder of the cranial blood vessels, especially the temporal artery. Common clinical symptoms include headache, inflammation in larger arteries causing pain and stiffness in the back, shoulder or neck, polymyalgia rheumatica, um, malaise, jaw pain, and ophthalmic symptoms. Clinical signs include temporal artery and scalp tenderness, fever, and a loss of vision. The exact cause of giant cell arteritis is unknown. Inflammation of the medium to large size arteries originating from the arc of the aorta is a hallmark of the disease. GCA is characterized by innate and adaptive immune system dysregulation, and the pathophysiology is thought to involve the body's inappropriate response to the vascular endothelial injury. Um, its exact etiology is also unknown, although several genetic and environmental factors have been hypothesized. Advancing age and Scandinavian ancestry are known risk factors. Um, this condition is rare um, in adults under the age of 50, and really it's rare in adults under the age of 70. Its ocular manifestations include amaurosis fugax, which is the transient loss of vision in one or both eyes um, for a defined period of time. Usually it's less than five minutes. We also see anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, this is an image of ophthalm ophthalmoplegia, which shows um, that the patient is able to uh, move one eye, but one eye is static. And then we also see cortical ischemia. The evaluation and management of GCA. Um, diagnosis is typically based on the clinical picture, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and C-reactive protein, as these may be elevated in patients with the disorder. Really, a temporal biopsy is needed for a definitive diagnosis. Treatment consists of systemic steroids, although really optimal dosing is unclear. The initial dosage begins with high-dose prednisone that is subsequently tapered over one to two years. Our nursing considerations include a good medical history um, is often crucial for diagnosis. Um, the prognosis is generally poor if untreated, and patients may require psychological support. Herpes simplex is a viral infection manifested in fever blisters, genital herpes, ocular herpes, and neonatal herpes. In recent years, the herpes virus has rapidly become a major cause of illness in the United States and around the world. Primary infection generally occurs through the oropharyngeal mucosa on exposure to secretions of an individual shedding HSV. The virus enters the epithelial cell, replicates and transports retrogradally through neurons to the dorsal root ganglia of the trigeminal nerve, where it stays latent. Recurrent infection due to viral replication in the sensory ganglia is induced by various stimuli, like trauma, ultraviolet radiation, immunosuppression, stress, which includes hormonal changes. HSV-specific CD8 T cells play an important role in recurrent infections. HSV infections incite an inconsistent antibody production, which offers only partial protection to recurrences or reinfections. The herpes simplex ophthalmicus is caused by neurotrophic double-stranded DNA viruses. HSV-1 causes orofacial and eye infections by contact from an infected individual 
while HSV2 causes genital disease transmitted sexually. HSV2 can be transmitted to neonates during birth through HSV2 infected genitalia of the mothers and to children through orofacial contact by infected adults. It's ocular manifestations. The most common sign of herpes simplex is dendritic keratitis. Uh, in dendr dendritic or branching keratitis or dendritic ulcers, the cornea is inflamed by the infection with the herpes simplex cold sore virus or herpes zoster virus. The lesions, as the name suggests, follow branching lines, and here we see an image of them, um, along which minute blisters may form and break, leaving raw areas. In addition, ocular inflammatory processes such as acute follicular keratoconjunctivitis, episcleritis, and blepharitis are also typical of the herpes simplex. Ocular manifestations include corneal opacification, corneal scarring, corneal ulcers, and hypopion. This photograph here shows episcleritis, which is an inflammatory condition affecting the episcleral tissue, which is between the conjunctiva, which remembers the clear mucosal membrane lining the inner eyelids and sclera, and the sclera, or the white part of the eye. Evaluation and management of the herpes simplex virus includes diagnostic tests, um, which involve corneal staining of the ulcer with fluorescein and swabbing for viral cultures. Uh, management goals are to minimize structural damage to the cornea and to preserve vision. Pharmacological treatments include antiviral agents such as oral acyclovir, especially for patients that have recurrence, viroptic drops, Vira A3% ointment, and acyclovir ointment. Other management options include corneal scraping. Recurrent episodes may result in visual impairment due to corneal scarring, and visual, visually significant corneal scarring may need to be treated with a corneal transplant. Nursing considerations, again, include um, taking a good patient history uh, to help develop a plan of care, educate patients regarding the risks of recurring attacks, uh, special consideration should be given to our higher risk populations, such as those that are immunocompromised, and we can help provide psychological support when appropriate. Herpes zoster, commonly called shingles, is an infection of the herpes zoster virus, varicella zoster, or the chickenpox virus. It can affect the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and occurs more frequently in the elderly, debilitated, stressed, or immunosuppressed individuals. The virus remains latent in the sensory ganglia of the cranial and spinal nerves, and upon reactivation, the virus causes symptoms to develop. The virus replicates in neuronal cell bodies, and virons shed from the cells which are carried down the nerve to the area of skin innervated by that ganglion. In the skin, the virus causes local inflammation and blistering. The pain caused by the zoster virus is due to inflammation of the affected nerves with the virus. It's important to remember that this typically only happens unilaterally and the dermatologic involvement is centripetal and follows a dermatome. Common ocular manifestations include swelling of the lids seen here in the lower left-hand photograph, epithelial or stromal keratitis, seen here in the lower right-hand photograph, decreased corneal sensation, episcleritis and scleritis, and anterior uveitis. Other symptoms can include Bell's palsy, leading to inadequate lid closure, and the appearance of vesicles on the tip of the nose, indicating involvement of the nasociliary nerve and probable involvement of the globe. A Hutchinson sign is the presence of a herpetic lesion at the tip or the side of the nose, with extension to the corner of the eye in some cases. This clinical sign is considered to be a strong predictive factor indicating ocular involvement in more than half of patients with herpes zoster. The evaluation and management includes diagnostics tests with corneal staining of the ulcer with fluorescein and swabbing of viral cultures. 
Management goals are again to minimize structural damage to the cornea and preserve vision. Pharmacological treatments include oral and topical antiviral agents such as valcyclovir, acyclovir, viroptic drops, vi vira A3% ointment, and acyclovir ointment. In addition, local steroids are used to decrease inflammation as well as midriatics to help reduce pain. Long-term pain relief may be needed. A corneal transplant is performed if visual impairment is due to corneal scarring. Our nursing considerations are primarily focused on the antiviral medications, steroids, and pain management, in addition to psychological support, especially for body image disturbance experienced by the patient. Horner's syndrome is a condition marked by a myotic pupil, ptosis, and local inability to sweat on one side of the face caused by damage to the sympathetic nerves on that side of the neck. Its pathophysiology is a consequence of sympathetic disruption. The symptomology depends on the location of the lesion and the severity depends on the degree of denervation. Its etiology, Horner syndrome is primarily an acquired condition secondary to systemic and local diseases or iatrogenic causes, but may be congenital and purely hereditary in some cases. Sympathetic fibers have an extensive course and can be interrupted during extracranial, intracranial, or intraorbital traversal. Its ocular manifestations include mild ptosis, seen here with this eyelid, a meiotic pupil, again, smaller pupil than this one, which is called anisocoria, and heterochromia is seen in genetic cases. The evaluation and management of Horner syndrome includes positive pharmacological pupil testing using cocaine may serve to confirm a diagnosis. Also, the use of hydroxyamphetamine may be used to differentiate a preganglionic from a postganglionic lesion, and adrenaline may be also be used to assess denervation supersensitivity. Our nursing considerations involve patient education for understanding the disease process, and we can also, again, help provide psychological support. Hypertension is defined as a persistent high blood pressure, the average of two or more blood pressure readings at two visits, where systolic pressure is equal to or greater than 140 millimeters of mercury and diastolic pressure is equal to or greater than 90 millimeters of mercury. The pathophysiology, because blood pressure equals cardiac output times the total peripheral vascular resistance, pathogenic mechanisms must involve either increased cardiac output, increased total peripheral vascular resistance, or both. In most patients, cardiac output is normal or slightly increased, and total peripheral vascular resistance is increased. This pattern is typical of primary hypertension and hypertension due to primary aldosteronism. Pheochromocytoma, renovascular disease, and renal parenchymal disease. Hemodynamics and physiologic components, plasma volume, activity of the renin angiotensin system, vary indicating that primary hypertension is most likely to have more than one cause. Even if one factor is initially responsible, multiple factors are probably involved in sustaining elevated blood pressure. Ocular manifestations of hypertension include retinopathy, hard exudates, cotton wool spots, flame-shaped hemorrhages, papilledema, retinal sclerotic changes, central retinal vein occlusion, and microaneurysms. Constricted visual fields may result from retinal vascular obstruction. So here we see what's known as a branch retinal vein occlusion in the center top picture. Um, a patient in this instance would have a, an inferior visual field cut. In the left picture, we see cotton wool spots, hard exudates, flame-shaped hemorrhages. 
And then in the right picture, we see a central retinal vein occlusion um, with a finding that we often call blood and thunder. The evaluation and management of hypertension in the ophthalmic setting includes direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy and fundus photography. And treatment is aimed at prevention and management of hypertension. Um, this can include uh, OCT photography, intravitreal injections, and recurrent follow-up. Our nursing considerations focus on education about hypertension, encouraging a reduction of salt intake, and promoting regular exercise and relaxation to control blood pressure. Other considerations include checking blood pressure at each office visit and reinforcing annual visits to the ophthalmologist to assess visual acuity, visual fields, as well as regular visits to the patient's primary care physician. Kaposi sarcoma is a multifocal malignant neoplasm of vascular origin. It may be present on the eyelid or conjunctiva or within the orbit, and it's caused by herpes virus type 8. Kaposi sarcoma, um, when well developed, are comprised of spindled shaped tumor cells, abnormal vessels, and variable chronic inflammatory infiltrate. Kaposi sarcoma ensues from complex and multifactorial events, including immunosuppression. A crucial role of viral agents has been supposed since the 1950s. Human herpes virus HHV8 has been found in the saliva and semen and may spread through contact with saliva and kissing as well as sexual activity, similarly to what occurs with other herpes viruses. Clinical presentations are purple red nodules that develop on the eyelids or conjunctiva and are sometimes but rarely seen in the orbit. Sometimes in the early stages, Kaposi sarcoma may be mistaken for a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Other ocular manifestations can include visual field defects, lid disfiguration, and tropian intrachiasis. Here in the top photograph, we see a Kaposi sarcoma that is causing an entropian or drooping eyelid. Um, and in this image, we see it uh, in the conjunctiva. Again, it takes the appearance of a subconjunctival hemorrhage, um, which can delay diagnosis. Evaluation and management of Kaposi sarcoma includes a positive pathology evaluation of a tissue biopsy is often the first step in determining the diagnoses. Metastases to visceral organs can occur. Carposi sarcoma is often asymptomatic, requiring no therapy. Upon diagnosis, treatment modalities include radiation, cryotherapy, and surgical excision, as well as an oncology consultation for systemic treatment with chemotherapeutic drugs. Our nursing consideration should include nursing goals that focus on prevention of other opportunistic infections by taking universal precautions, disinfection and or sterilization of equipment after each use, and extreme care in handling and sterilizing instruments. Collaborative efforts include, but are not limited to, psychological support, referral to community resources, and ongoing patient education. Lead poisoning is a disorder characterized by neurotoxicity from lead that may result in death if severe. The exact pathophysiologic mechanism of lead poisoning is not yet clear, but it is known that lead competes with other minerals in cellular systems, especially calcium and zinc. Therefore, it disrupts several cellular processes that depend on these minerals. Etiologically, leaded paint was commonly used until 1960 and mostly eliminated by 1978. Thus, for a significant number of older housing units, leaded paint still poses some hazard. Lead poisoning is usually caused by direct ingestion of leaded paint chips from cracked peeling paint. During home remodeling, patients may be exposed to significant amounts of aerosolized lead in the form of particles scraped or sanded off during surface preparation for repainting. Some ceramic glazes contain lead which can leach lead, particularly when in contact with acidic substances. Lead-contaminated moonshine whiskey and folk remedies are possible sources, as are occasional lead foreign objects in the stomach or other tissues. Bullets lodged in soft tissues near synovial fluid 
or cerebrospinal fluid may increase blood lead levels, but that process may take years. There's also occupational exposure and fumes of leaded gasoline in countries other than the United States recreationally inhaled for central nervous system effects may also cause leaded poisoning. The ocular manifestations include papilledema, which we see in the bottom photograph here, optic neuritis, which again, inflammation of the optic nerve that we are seeing here as well, optic nerve atrophy, which looks like a pale optic nerve, retinal turbidity, and retinal venous distension. Evaluation and management includes direct and indirect ophthalmoscopies um, are commonly done to rule out lead poisoning and prevention of lead poisoning is the crucial goal in addition to treatment of symptoms when they do appear. Um, for our nursing considerations, patient education is targeted toward prevention and rational approaches focus on occupational and environmental hazards. Leukemia is a neoplastic disorder characterized by an abnormal proliferation of white blood cells. Its pathophysiology, leukemia occurs due to the malignant transformation of pluripotent, which can give rise to both myeloid and lymphoid precursors, hematopoietic stem cells. Rarely, it can also involve a more committed stem cell that has limited self-renewal capacity. In acute leukemias, these malignant cells are generally immature, poorly differentiated, abnormal leukocytes that can either be lymphoblasts or myeloblasts. These blasts can undergo clonal expansion and proliferation leading to replacement and interference of the development and function of normal blood products with malignant cells leading to clinical symptoms. Its etiology. Multiple genetic and environmental risk factors are identified in the development of leukemia, including exposure to ionizing radiation, exposure to benzene, previous exposures to chemotherapy, especially alkylating agents, which increases the risk for acute leukemia. A history of hematologic malignancy is a risk factor for subsequently developing other subtypes of leukemia. Viral infections are linked with subtypes of leukemia and several genetic syndromes are also associated with an increased risk. Acute leukemia presents with fever, a history of hemorrhage or bruising and lymph node enlargement. A physical exam reveals hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and lymphadenopathy. Ocular involvement is more common in acute than in chronic leukemia. Virtually all ocular structures may be involved. Death results from the effects of tumor bulk, infection, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. Our ocular signs and symptoms include a hypopion, seen here, which again is just uh, pus that is in the anterior chamber, subconjunctival hemorrhages, and a hyphema. Hyphema seen here in the upper left is blood in the anterior chamber. Other manifestations involve retinopathy related features such as venous tortuosity and dilation, flame shaped hemorrhages seen here in the right photograph, and retinal detachment. The evaluation and management of leukemia uh, diagnosis is based on direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy, hematological analysis, and a positive bone marrow biopsy. Treatment is directed at the underlying disease process and consists of comprehensive treatment modalities of chemotherapeutic agents, radiation therapy, transfusions, antibiotics for superinfections, and stem cell or bone marrow transplants. Our nursing considerations again include patient education about the systemic disease and its ocular manifestations. A, multi a multidisciplinary approach includes nutritional consultation, psychological support, and potential socioeconomic assistance for patients and families. Systemic lupus is a chronic multi-system inflammatory disease characterized by striking immunological abnormalities. 
The pathophysiology and pathogenesis of systemic lupus is complex and the understanding of this pathogenesis is constantly evolving. A break in the tolerance of genetically susceptible individuals on exposure to environmental factors leads to an activation of autoimmunity. Cell damage caused by infectious and other environmental factors exposes the immune system to self-antigens, leading to activation of T and B cells, which become self-sustained by chronic self-aimed immune responses. Cytokines release, complement activ activation, and autoantibody production lead to organ damage. Lupus is a multi-systemic disease with an unknown etiology. However, several genetic, immunological, endocrine, and environmental factors play a role in the ietopathogenesis of systemic lupus. Clinical manifestations vary according to severity, progression, and organ involvement. Ocular signs of lupus are keratoconjunctivitis sicca, which is seen in the uppermost photograph here. This is also commonly seen in patients that complain of dry eye syndrome. Necrotizing scleritis, seen here on this patient where we see the sclera becoming black and necrosing. Cotton wool spots with or without hemorrhages. The presence of arterial dilation and optic neuropathy. In rare circumstances, peripheral corneal thinning and occlusion of retinal arterioles may develop. Slowly progressive multi-system organ dysfunction results in visual loss secondary to optic neuropathy. The evaluation and management of lupus is diagnosed primarily by slit lamp microscopy and direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy. A Schirmer tear test is performed to evaluate for keratoconjunctivitis sicca again, dry eye syndrome. Rose Bengal staining is used to determine devitalized epithelium and mucin damaged by reduced tear volume. Ocular treatment consists of systemic steroids, temporary or permanent punctal occlusion by use of punctal plugs, and laser or surgical punctoplasty, and a regional transplant is considered in severe cases. Our nursing considerations, again, uh, focus is placed on teaching the patient about protecting the cornea by a frequent installation of artificial tears and when we use rose bengal to rinse the eyelid after each procedure and avoid staining clothes. Consideration is also given to steroid management in lupus. This concludes part one of this presentation. Here are the references.